All right, who are you inviting to Easter? Do you have someone in mind already? There's somebody in your contacts that uh, you know. By the way, Easter is the one time a year that the vast majority of people have an open heart to an invitation. And, and I know it makes you nervous to invite. We're going to do a quick thing right now. If you take out your phones, you're going to take a selfie with this in the background, and then you're going to send it to somebody, and you're just going to tell them, all right? I'm at church. I love it. Please come with me next Sunday. Join me for Easter, all right? You got your phones? Come on. Stand up. Take a selfie. I'll look at you guys. You don't take selfies? There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. You're saved. You're saved. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Send that to someone. Send it. Let them know that you're here. By the way, if they say they, they can't, it's no big deal. You, you know, maybe next time. That's all you respond. Maybe next time. It's not a big deal. Don't lose sleep over it. But this is a great opportunity. Also, uh, thank you so much for serving with uh, Pioneer Translators. Oh, my goodness. We believe in that ministry so much. The fact that somebody would go right in and live among people, learn the dialect, uh, help translate the Bible into their language so they have a Bible. Your, your Bible with nothing in it, man, I want one of those. That's a very powerful illustration. And uh, on behalf of Lincoln Christian Church, we trust Pioneer Bible translators. That's why we give to them. And here are some people who have been right on the front line, uh, Poland and Ukraine. That's huge. And you deserve a hero's welcome. But thank you so much for everything you do. One last thing, uh, and I know not, every, uh, not everyone in the room gets this opportunity, but I do, and uh, today Bonnie and I are celebrating 40 years of marriage, today, 40 years. <laughs> she's had me for 40 years, and this is as far as she's gotten with me. <laughs> Come on, whose fault is it really, when you think about it? Anyway, happy anniversary, honey, I love you very, very much. All right, we're going to jump in here. i got to move fast. Tommy Bell was a referee for the NFL in the 70s, uh, the early 70s. He was a very, very respected NFL referee. He was a, a lawyer during the week. He would tell people uh, at speaking events that uh, during the week I practice law, but on Sunday I am the law. <laughs> and, uh, and, and all the players really appreciated Tommy Bell. Uh, Tommy Bell was a Christian. He went to all kinds of speaking events. I'm going to share with you his favorite story that he would tell over and over again. Tommy Bell uh, was in a football game uh, refereeing, and uh, Fred uh, Arba Arbanus is the tight end for a little-known team called the uh, Chiefs. Anyway, <laughs> Fred Arbanus hit a man so hard his eye popped out. And Tommy Bell was right there. It wasn't until that moment that all the referees and all the team and all the people watching on television realized that Fred Arbanus had one artificial eye. He had one glass eye. And when he hit it, popped out. It wasn't hard to find. They found it. They washed it up, popped it back in his eye. And Fred, this referee, is standing under this mountain of a man the entire time just going, Fred, are you kidding me? You have only one eye? You have one good eye? He goes, I cannot believe you're still playing football. Oh, my goodness. What would you ever do if you ever lost sight in that other eye? And Fred Arbanus looked down at him and said, well, I guess I'd just become an official like you, Mr. Bell. <laughs> Why do football players play hurt? There's countless stories of football players who push themselves in pain for the most unbelievable moments of, of, of sports history. They play with hurt hands and hurt backs and hurt knees. And especially if it's the big game like the Super Bowl, don't take me out, coach. Let me stay in. I want to keep playing. And, and there's these amazing stories of people playing hurt. Why do they do that? Well, because the after party is greater than the moment of pain. The after party is greater than the moment of pain. They focus on something beyond the pain, something on the other side of the pain. How do you get through the pain of this world? Because this world hurts. <laughs> this world is full of pain. How do you get through it? We do it not by focusing on the pain. Man, if, you get all, if all you focus on is the hurts in your life, the disappointments, the failures, 
Um, that is no way to live. As Christians, we've learned to look past that. We look to heaven. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the Bible says. We fix our eyes on him. And that helps us through the pains of this world. But when Jesus was going to the cross, what did he focus on? <laughs> he didn't focus on himself. Not my will be done, but your will be done. He focused on getting back to the Father. That's what he focused on. There's songs out there of when Jesus was hanging on a cross, he was thinking of you. I'm not so sure. I think what was on his heart was just one thing, doing the Father's will. I think that's what helped him to pray, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I think that's what helped him to cry out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? I think it was his focus on the Father and getting back to him. Today we're going to go through the cross. I know next Sunday's Easter. I know that. We love to race to Easter. But before we can get to the celebration of Easter, God takes us through the horrors of the cross. The cross story is just as important as the Easter story. Before you go running off to next Sunday, God takes us through Friday. And there's a reason for it. This is important. We're in this series that we've titled, you can say that again, that 10 stories, all four gospel writers tell. The crucifixion is one of them. Next Sunday will be Easter. And of course, all four gospel writers tell us about Easter, but there will be a different graphic next Sunday. So today's the last chance for me to use that. You can say that again. God heard what Matthew wrote and said, you can say that again and heard what Mark wrote. You can say that again. And Luke and then even John tells the story of the crucifixion. There are some pieces in the crucifixion that seem to be a priority to God because not all four gospel writers tell us all the details of the cross, but there are uh, four or five details that all four repeat. So this must be important to God that you get this, these details. This is just the facts for a few moments. Can I just give you the facts of the story? All four gospel writers tell you that Jesus was crucified, that there were criminals, that there was a notice, king of uh, the Jews over his head, that there was mocking and the casting for uh, lots for his clothing. Now those pieces, God said, these are important. What I discovered this week is the reason they're so important is because 600 to 1,000 years earlier, God put those as markers that this is not going to be my chosen one. This will be my Messiah. For the skeptics in the room, we're really glad you're here. But I just don't know how you handle and answer away the prophecies that are that far in advance that all come true in one man's story. And these are just a few of the prophecies. I'll share with you four or five prophecies today that come true in just the cross alone. But his birth, all those prophecies come true. Much of his ministry, the prophecies regarding that all came true in Jesus. And then when you ask Christians, why do we believe in the second coming, the prophecy of the second coming? Because all these prophecies came true behind me. Of course what's out in front of me is going to come true. Here we go. Buckle up. I'm going to move real quick through these facts. Number one, the fact that Jesus was crucified. When they came to a place called the skull, they crucified him there. Psalms was written a thousand years before Jesus, and it says, Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. We all know that Jesus was crucified with nails. It would have been probably in the lower part of his palm, uh, almost his wrist. Right there, there's enough meat and bone there to hold a man's body. He would have been pierced right through there. And it would have been so masterfully done, the Romans were able to do that without cutting an artery to inflict the maximum amount of pain. He would have been nailed through his feet, one foot laid on top of the other, and a large spike driven right down through the top of this. If, if this sounds excruciating, it is excruciating. God wanted you to know this detail that Jesus went through this amount of pain because of what you and I would carry as sin and baggage in our life. You don't have to pay for your sins because he paid for it. Number two, the mocking and the casting of lots. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. <laughs> That means they're gambling for him. The people stood watching. The rulers even sneered at him. They said, he, he saved others. 
Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. You know, it's just unfathomable to me that the rulers did this, that the leaders of, of, of the Jewish religion did this because they knew what was prophesied in the Old Testament and they, hatred will just blind you, just completely blind you to what you're doing, by the way. Hatred will deceive you so fast. And, and that must be what happened because in Psalm 22, written a thousand years earlier, it says, all who, mock, all who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they said, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And then a little further down that same chapter, they divide my clothes among them. They cast lots for my clothing. <laughs> did, they, did they just mock Jesus with the very thing that God said they would mock Jesus? They had to know that passage, but they quoted almost word for word. God, again, trying to convince a, a skeptical society that this is it. This, he's the one. He's the one I've been telling you about. And I told you to look for this a thousand years earlier. Number three, the inscription over his head, there was written notice above him, which read, King of the Jews. I didn't even put down all the passages of prophecy because Israel for a long, long time have been looking forward to a king who would come, who would be of the line of David, who would be of the tribe of Judah, who would bring in a kingdom that would last forever. They've been constantly looking for this because it's prophesied it so often in the Old Testament. A new king is coming. Here, Pilate writes, king of the Jews. And the, the religious leaders didn't like it. You got to take that down. He's not our king. Sounds like our current society, doesn't it? Jesus, you got to get Jesus out of here. He's not our king. But Pilate, uh, a government official, and not a believer, by the way, but a government official gave that declaration. What I have written is written. It stands. 30 years before the cross, just 30 years before the cross, a group of wise men showed up. Do you remember what they were asking? Where is he born king of the Jews? The inscription stands. It's a marker. It's laid out for you and I to help us in our, our faith is not a blind step. There's enough there to step out on and believe. And then finally, number four, the criminals on both sides. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Three crosses, Jesus is always in the middle. The one, the one on Jesus' right started also hurling insults at Jesus. He, he heard it from the crowd, the mocking of the crowd. I don't know. Was he trying to show, hey, I'm just like you guys. Maybe you ought to bring me. I don't know what was going on in his mind, but for some reason, he hurls insults at Jesus. The one on his left rebukes him. Hey, what you and I are being crucified for, we deserve, but this man is innocent. And then he prays one of the most amazing prayers in Luke 23, verse 42, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come to your, into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> I, I love, I, I just love that this man in the last moments of his life saw enough. No, no previous record of him knowing Jesus, no previous record of him hearing a sermon or seeing a miracle, none of that. It's just watching how Jesus was handling his pain. The first thing the man on the left would have heard was Jesus pray, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Hearing that prayer must have just jarred him inside. He couldn't do that. Then watching the character of Jesus on the cross the entire time, his conversation with John, him taking care of his mother, all of the little pieces and the statements that are said from the cross, he heard all of them. And then he watched the entire world go dark. A darkness right in the middle of the day fell on that hillside that day. It couldn't be explained. Just a, just a darkness. And when this man sees all of that, it's enough for him to say, remember me. I love that. 
I'm disappointed that this man saw all the same stuff. He saw all the evidence, all the proofs. He heard the prayer, Father, forgive them. He saw the character of Jesus in death. He watched the same world turn dark. By the way, a, a centurion soldier who was there, that was enough for him to declare, truly this is the Son of God. But for this thief, salvation was just a few feet away and he couldn't get there. His blindness stayed with him right up to the end. And there is again a picture of our families, a picture of our friends, a picture of our world. There's a blindness that will not let go of them or that they won't let go of. And then there are those who open up their eyes to who Jesus is and they cry out in a quick prayer, Father, forgive them. God wanted you to know these details. Why? Well, I'll take them even further. Real quick. Um, oh, by the way, the, the prophecy regarding this Criminals, before I go on, Isaiah 53. He poured out his life unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. Okay, why was all of this important to God? There are three trees. A few weeks ago, we talked about three gardens in the Bible. The Garden of Eden, the Garden uh, in, in Paradise and Revelation, and then the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus yields up his spirit to the Father. There's three trees. The first tree is in the Garden of Eden. It's the tree of life. It's the tree that God said, hey, don't touch that. Don't, don't eat of that. But Adam and Eve, they, they don't listen. Because of a conversation with a serpent, we, we find out that the serpent is the devil. He's Satan. But there's this conversation with a serpent that talks them into doing something they shouldn't do. Be, be careful who you talk to. And be careful in this world who you allow to talk to you. Because conversations with serpents never go well. And the world's full of serpents. And so they eat of this fruit. They introduce sin to our world. They introduce death to our world. They introduce a curse to our world. And since that tree, all of us, have the same sin, curse, and death on us. We, we all have it from all through history. That's the first tree. The third tree is the tree that's found in uh, Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible. Don't you love that when God does that? Book ends. Tree here, tree there. Just who could, who could masterfully write the scriptures like this? Nobody has a Bible like this. And, and in, the, in the Revelation 22, there's a Garden of Eden again, uh, 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 eternal life. Death is put away. God says, behold, I'm making all things new. And there's a tree of life there also. And this is a tree we all want to get to. It doesn't matter about the first tree. We all want to make sure we find ourselves in heaven with that third tree. And surprise of surprises, to get from the first tree to the third tree, we have to go through the middle tree. And the middle tree is the cross of Jesus Christ. It all flows through him. And you're like, Ron, it's so curious you're calling it a, a tree. 1 Peter chapter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live righteously. His wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. Acts 13, when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and they laid him in a tomb. <laughs> Everything unraveled in the Garden of Eden. Everything is restored in heaven, paradise. Over here, a thief lost paradise. <laughs> Adam stole the fruit he shouldn't have stolen. Over here, a thief lost paradise. Over here, a thief finds paradise. And it's all because of one name, Jesus Christ. I make no apologies about this today. If you're a guest with us today, we're glad you're here, but you came in to hear a dangerous message. You can't go to heaven without Jesus Christ, period. You have to accept him. You have to have a relationship with him. Otherwise, you're saying that you will stand in judgment for your own sins. If you don't accept his sacrifice for your sins, you're going to pay for your own sins. And you will not like the nightmare that follows that decision. We live in a world where, for a lot of people, they think 
They think living lost is easy and being saved is hard. And that's how Satan has fooled us. That's not accurate. Being saved is easy. It's staying lost that's hard, painful. And some of you are sitting out there right now going, well, Ron's a preacher, you know. He, he, he doesn't have the list of mistakes behind him. <laughs> yes, I do. I mean, I'm a preacher. I'm proud of the ministry that I do, but I've been at this now for four decades. I have stood and held newborn babies countless times and have laid a blessing on them. Worked with teenagers, worked with adults, worked with senior ministers. I've traveled to Indonesia and have spoken there to missionaries and encouraged. I've served in an orphanage in Mexico a number of times. I've preached countless sermons and baptized countless people. But if it weren't for Jesus Christ saving this sinner, I would have no hope of getting to heaven. He's my only boast. I'm a sinner saved just like you are. And these earthly accomplishments, good for me, but they're just earthly accomplishments. The one great decision I made in my life was just like the thief on the cross. Jesus, remember me when you get to your kingdom. And just like that decision wrote him into the greatest story of all times, my decision writes me into that same story. And today you can have your life written into that story too. But you have to accept Jesus Christ. I think I'm done.